Hey, everybody. I was just sitting here reading uh, Heart of Darkness and thinking, man, I would love to talk about Heart of Darkness some more. And then I was like, well, maybe I can make a video and help some students out. So I'm on page eight. I got Gregor holding down my page for me. Um, and I am going to talk about this scene that doesn't get a lot of uh, attention, but I think is doing some really interesting and clever things. Let's zoom in on this. I'm on page eight. So here, uh, Marlo is going into the office to get some, um, to get a physical basically for his job. And when the secretary opens the door, you get this discussion of the secretary, um, as, uh, a compassionate expression and a skinny forefinger beckoned me into the sanctuary. Well, and a sanctuary has this religious sort of like tomb like kind of feel to it. And then you add that with the skinny forefinger and that skinny forefinger seems sort of skeletal. So already, um, Conrad is setting the scene here for something that's funereal, like uh, death-like. Um, its light was dim, and a heavy writing desk sat in the middle. From behind that structure came an, an impression of pale plumpness in a frock coat, the great man himself. So this is the this is like the judge sitting there um, in the office, the big boss. And if you've read Dante, this has a very Dantean element to it. This like judge sitting here. Um, uh, assigning people to certain levels. Um, and uh, he shook hands, I fancy muttered vaguely, was satisfied with my French bon voyage. In about 45 seconds, I found myself again in the waiting room with the compassionate secretary who, full of desolation and sympathy, made me sign some document. And desolation seems such a, like such a weird emotion to have here. This is a very odd reaction. It's, it's like overwhelming sadness, and the secretary is overwhelmingly sad and sympathetic. She feels so bad about something that it's it's kind of... It's kind of creepy, and she makes him sign a document. Um, and he says, I believe I undertook, amongst other things, not to disclose trade secrets. So he's signing like an NDA, like a non-disclosure agreement, a contract with the company, not to talk about the things that he sees or the things that he learns, um, which doesn't seem uh, initially to be to be odd. I mean, it's odd that he's signing one for a job like this, but lots of jobs have NDAs. Um but knowing what you know, that all these atrocities are occurring in the Congo, you can, you can understand why the company has one, and it seems kind of sinister in retrospect. Um, pause. Unpause. Sorry about that. Um, so he says, well, I'm not going to, uh, which is ironic because that's exactly what he's doing with this book. Like, he is going to disclose all kinds of secrets. Um, and then he, so he says, like, I began to feel uneasy. And I like that he says, I began, because I would have been uneasy long before now. But, you know, maybe Marlo's just not as quick on the uptake. You know, I am not used to such ceremonies. and There was something ominous in the atmosphere, very much so. It was just as though I had been led into some conspiracy. Which, again, is ironic, because he has been led into a conspiracy. He is now a part of the problem and the machine. Um... So he is complicit, and but whatever it is, he's glad to get out. So he says, in the outer room, the two women knitted black wool feverishly. Here is just a thing. If you ever see a book or a movie or whatever where you have female characters that are interacting with yarn or thread, they're sewing, they're knitting, they're crocheting, uh, they're weaving, that is that is almost always uh, a representation of the fates. You've got your Greek version, you've got your Norse version, but basically they're women that uh, measure out yarn and they weave it and they cut it and it's sort of symbolic of measuring out a man's life and his, and his path and his goal. Um, they're, they're sort of in this underworld setting um, and it's black wool and they're doing it feverishly. It's like they can't make enough of this black garment, whatever it is. Uh, people were arriving and the younger one was walking back and forth introducing them. The old one sat on her chair. She had flat cloth slippers. Um, she's got a cat. She's got a white like hat on her head. She's got a wart on one cheek. So she, you know, she's an attractive older lady. Um, and she glanced at me over the glasses, the, the glasses, the swift and indifferent placidity of that look troubled me. She looks at him and there's nothing. There's no emotion. There's no concern. There's no care. It's like she's completely a blank slate. She's indifferent to him. Um, and so maybe she's just a cold, heartless person. Uh, or maybe she's just seen so much that 
she's she's like burned out. Um, two of the youths, so other dudes that are here for jobs, with foolish and cheery countenance were being piloted over, and she threw at them the same quick glance of un- uncertain wisdom. So it's not just Marlo she's looking at like that. She looks at everybody that way. She seemed to know all about them and about me, too. An eerie feeling came over me. She seemed uncanny and fateful. Okay, so, you know, there we get fateful. So Conrad's basically like, hey, if you didn't get that I was making an allusion to the fates, I'm going to just go ahead and make it clear to you that's what I was doing. Um, it's cute. It's clever. Um, often far away where I thought of these... Um, often far away there, I thought of these two guarding the door of darkness. So um, even when he's away in the Congo in the jungle, he still thinks of these two women guarding this door, like they're guarding the the, the gates of the underworld, knitting black wool as for a warm pall, like a, a, a shroud, one introducing continuously to the unknown, the other scrutinizing with unconcerned eyes. So you have the young one who is like, yes, come this way to uncertain doom, and the older one who's like, ah, there's another one. Um, old knitter of black wool, moratori de salutant. Uh, and that is... Um, Um, a Roman uh, saying, so it's Latin, and uh, it's what gladiators would say before they were in the arena and they would fight to the death, and it says, we who are about to die salute you. Um, They would be talking to the Caesar or whomever was in charge. Um, Not many of those she looked at ever saw her again, not half by a long way. So those people she's looking at, she doesn't see these people again. They... Over half of them walk out that door and to their death. And that's, that's sort of the, the horror of this business and the, like, this disposableness of people. And a lot of times in books or movies or television, and even here in Heart of Darkness, you're gonna get this repeated image about, um, darkness and evil and, and, pause. (laughs) Sorry. And, uh, sort of like blackness, sort of equaling evil. But here you get um, like this, this the danger of, of whiteness, and the danger of paleness, and um, and the the inhumanness of that pale color. Because pale is death, and we don't always remember that when we're talking about color symbolism. But you know, like you're talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and death rides a pale horse. Um, there is this connotation within our culture that pale is bad. Think about a person. When a person is pale, uh, they have no blood. That that's bad. That's a sign of something is wrong within them. So so here you get s- repeated discussions about pale and death and like this um, this image here. You've got that idea of the sepulcher on the previous page. A sepulcher is a tomb. Um, because Conrad is emphasizing to you the sort of finality of this. Um, then he goes to the doctor, a simple formality, you know, um, assured me this, assured the secretary with an air of taking an immense part in all my sorrows. I love that the secretary is just like, she feels so bad for him. She's like, Oh, we're going to go to the doctor. It's fine. It's going to be okay. Um, and he, he, while he's waiting for the doctor, he meets this, this young man who is a clerk. And he says the clerk was shabby and careless. He had ink stains. He's got a, like a tie that's really like sloppy under his chin. Um, and so he has a drink with this guy and, um, the, um, um, so he has a drink with this guy, sorry. And, and so Conrad's like, well, Marlo, Marlo's like, well, why, why have you never, you know, gone out there and done this? And this list clerk is like, oh, I am not such a fool as I look, quoth Plato to his disciples. And, and he drinks. So this clerk, is, he's worked here for a while, who knows this business, who knows what's going on. He's like, mm, I'm not an idiot. And that that should be a red flag to Marlo, but it's absolutely not. Um, if... If I were living in, if I were walking through this, I, I just don't know if I would be making the same choices that Marlo makes. But so then he goes to the doctor. The doctor felt my pulse, evidently thinking of something else all the while. So the doctor's really not even engaged in this. Uh, good, good for there, he mumbled. Like, I, I guess, I guess Marlo's good enough to, you know, go out to the jungle. Um, and then with a certain eagerness, so he, he 
pipes up suddenly, um, asks whether I would let him measure my head. And so Marlowe's like, yeah, you guess you could measure my head. And he brings all these calipers, which are like these like claw things. And he measures, um, he measures Marlowe's head sort of all the way around. This was a practice, um, that people used to think that the shape and size and bumps on your head indicated your sort of mental, uh, capacity, um, that is not true. It is disproven, but that's sort of what the doctor is doing. He's measuring Marlowe's head to see, um, Marlowe's sort of mental capacity. Um, and, uh, and Marlowe, you know, like, he's like, I thought him a harmless old fool. So the doctor is not much to look at. And, um, the doctor says, I always ask leave in the interest of science to measure the crania of those going out there. He said, and when they come back to, I asked, Oh, I never see them, he remarked. And moreover, and moreover, the changes take place inside, you know. So that, okay, so if his idea is to do like sort of a po- pre-test, post-test, and he's going to measure Marlowe's head and see what the changes are, he would have to do the post-test part, but he never sees these people again. So there's something sort of um, pointless in this activity. It doesn't work. And... Even then he even goes further. So he's not even doing a post test, but he goes further to say, oh, well, the changes take place on the inside. Well, then why are you measuring his head? Like it, it's, it's this random act for act's sake without any rationale or reason behind it. And this is an, this is a, going to be a repeated motif throughout here of people doing things for no particular reason and it being a a wasted effort, uh, um, a futile uh, idea. Um, and the changes take place on the inside. So Marlowe is going out into this Congo and the doctor knows that Marlowe is going to change, um, because you're going to have to change. But this is also sort of Conrad too, coming in and saying, well, the changes take place on the inside. That's where the real value is. Um, that's where the learning is going to be. So inside of him, um, all right, and I'm going to stop there because this is now over 10 minutes. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, some of that lecture. Maybe I'll do some more mini lectures again. Bye, everybody.